And this is the way the rest of the week will go. We will um, read uh, pages 370 to 376 today. Uh, we will answer the clip 9 and 10. Uh, and uh, then um, you, will, uh, you will have some time to study for your test. Um, that's on Friday. Uh, and then tomorrow... Uh, so, um, tomorrow uh, we will um, finish up the uh, engaged questions. We will have probably a goodly amount of time uh, tomorrow to uh, prepare for that test as well. We'll play the Keezer quiz on Thursday if we can get through the whole thing. Uh, if not, you'll have to watch the rest of it on YouTube. I will make sure that um, is up and running right after school. Uh, and then uh, you take that chapter uh, 14 class on Friday. And that's all we're planning to do on Friday, so we can deal with the material on that as well. Questions about any of that? Excellent. So uh, we're rolling. Uh, I want you to turn to page 370 in your big atheist book. So it starts with, how can the Bible be inerrant? Uh, do I have a volunteer to read until uh, objections to error, inerrance? Thank you, Eli. And nice and loud so the people at home can hear. If Jesus confirmed that the Old Testament was an errant word of God, and if the promised New Testament was confirmed in an errant word of God, of course, Aren't there scores, if not hundreds, of errors in the Bible? No, the Bible does not have errors. It certainly has alleged errors. In fact, I and another professor at Southern Evangelical Seminary, Thomas Howe, have written a book entitled When Critics Ask, which addresses more than 800 difficulties critics have identified in the Bible. There is also more on inerrancy in the systematic theology volume. While we certainly can't improve the context of those books originally, here are a few points. Okay, let me stop for just a second. Over there, I have, if, you, if, there's, if someone tells you there's a, a, a something about uh, outrageous in the Bible or there's a problem, I have a book over here called The Big Book of Bible Difficulty. And it is. It's a big book. So if you have a question or if someone tells you that, come borrow my Big Book of uh, Bible Difficulties. First, let's tell them logically why the Bible can't have error. One, God cannot error. Two, the Bible is the word of God. And three, therefore the Bible cannot error. Since this is a valid syllogism, if the premises are true, then the conclusion is true. The Bible clearly declares itself to be the word of God, which gives us strong evidence that it is. The Bible also informs us several times that God cannot err, and we know this from the general revelation. So the conclusion is inevitable. The Bible cannot err. If the Bible erred in anything it affirms, then God would be mistaken. But God cannot be the case. So what happens when we think we've done an error in the Bible? Augustine had the answer. If we are perplexed by any apparent contradiction in Scripture, we are to pray. It is not allowable to say, the author of this book is mistaken, but he thinks the manuscript is faulty or the translation is wrong, and we cannot ever say. In other words, it's more likely that we made an error in the Bible. And when critics ask, Identify 17 errors that they see in the evidence. Here's a summary of just one. Assuming that divergent counts are contradictory. As we've seen, it's not a contradiction if one gospel writer says he saw one angel at the end, and another says he saw two. Then he doesn't say there was only one. And if there were two, there would certainly be at least one. So divergence is always a contradiction. Then it often suggests genuine eyewitness testimony. I'd like to understand the context of the Sometimes we may think we found a contradiction in the Bible, but instead we simply take the passage out of context. An obvious example would be Psalm 14, verse B, which says, There is no God. 
However, the proper context is revealed when the full verse is read. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Presuming that the Bible approves of all the biblical critics may cite the holy of Solomon, 1 Kings 11 3, as an example of a contradiction. Doesn't the Bible teach monogamy, not polygamy? Four. If God certainly does not approve of every act according to the Bible, the recorded state is not being wise as well, but God doesn't approve of everything. God's standards are found in what the Bible reveals, not everything. As we have seen, instead of this being an argument that the Bible has errors, it is actually an argument that the Bible is virtue. The fact that the Bible records all the things that don't equally generally be true, no one would make absolute doctrine that is wrong. Forgetting that the Bible is a human book with human characters. Critics have been known to falsely impugn the integrity of the Bible by expecting a level of expression that is higher than that which is customary for the Bible. However, this is illegitimate because most of the Bible was not verbally dictated but written by human authors. The exception is the Ten Commandments, which were written in the standard of God alone. The writers were human composers who recorded their own literary styles and engaged with them. They were historical narratives, poetry, prayers, prophecy, personal letters, theological treatises, and other bits of literature. These writers speak from a human standpoint when they wrote, and the sun is rising or setting. They also reveal human thought patterns, including memory lapses as well as humanism. In short, since God used the styles of over 40 authors over the 1,500 years to get his message across, it is wrong to expect a level of expression to be greater than that of a human writer. However, with the right seeming and the Bible, the human nature does not err. Okay, next uh, person want to uh, read the Bible verse? Objects to in inerrancy uh, to just, oh, um, to uh, conclusion and so on. You want to read that? Thank you. That will be nice and long. Uh, critics may say human errors, humans error, so the Bible is error. But again, as the critic who is there, human beings error, but humans don't always err. Valuable people write books all the time to have no error. Valuable people who are guided by the Holy Spirit certainly can write books without any errors. So are you just arguing your circle, the critic might ask, by using the Bible to prove the Bible? No, we're not arguing your circle because we're not starting with the assumption that the Bible is an inspired book. We're starting with several separate, separate doctrines that have been that have proven that have proven beyond reason, reasonable doubt to be historically reliable. Since those are proofs of what Jesus is God, then we know his teaching from the Old Testament. On several occasions, Jesus has not only in the Old Testament the Word of God, but is also in there. He also promised that the rest of God's truth, all truth, would come to the apostles from the Holy Spirit. The apostles then wrote the New Testament and proved their authority through miracles. Therefore, the authority of Jesus to be God in the New Testament is confirmed by the Bible. Thus, not arguing in a circle, but it's arguing inductively. Collecting evidence and following the evidence where it leads. Critics may also charge, but your position on the inerrancy is not false. Not falsifiable. We will not accept an error in the Bible because it's decided to lose the of the meeting. Actually, our position is falsifiable. But the critic's position is not. Let's just play. Jesus' authority is well established by the evidence. We reasonably give the benefit of the doubt to the Bible when we run across a difficulty or a question in the text. In other words, when we run across something we can explain to them, we assume that we, not the infant God, are making an error. It's more likely that neither in turn. Are arguing that the Bible is wrong. However, that doesn't mean that there is no possibility of correcting the Bible and errors. After all, there's always a chance that our conclusion on the errors is wrong. We are certainly not in error. In fact, our conclusion on the errors is be falsified if someone could trace a real error back to the original source. But to this day, after nearly 2,000 years of living, no one has found such a conclusion that the Bible is false. This is true that this is truly made in the Bible is true. But the legislative documents written. Forty authors over fifteen to twenty years. Where could you find such agreement on a variety of issues from forty authors who all articulated the same idea? That's over fifteen hundred years ago. Second, even if the inerrancy is falsified in some way, that wouldn't falsify the central truth of the Bible. As we've seen, the historical evidence that Jesus is not from our truth is incontrovertible when the guy rose from the dead. Even if the scriptures are found to be the only people who 
Why would you depreciate on your We hasten to add, we hasten to add no inerrancy, whatever be falsified, but if it is, Christianity will still be true beyond the reason of that. If there is any discovery that causes to disbelieve the truth, is there any discovery that causes to disbelieve Christianity? Yes. If someone could find the body of Jesus, Christianity would be proven false and we could not. In fact, we insist it's false and false. We should obey the living being, Jesus is not actually right. This is unique about Christianity. Unlike the most other religious worldviews, Christianity is built on historical events and the miracles of the Holy Spirit. The false and false accounts of the Holy Spirit. The Congress sketches in faith and Christianity are all historical events of the Holy Spirit. People who lived in Jerusalem at the time of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit were found to be the Father, and they did it around the city. Then Prime's body and actually did it at the Holy Spirit. And nothing has been found since. And after 2,000 years of looking, no one can find the remains of Jesus in the great grave in Galilee. We can find it possible that the Zion is in. When a question of the and not after 2,000 years, when? Third, after many years of continuing a careful study of the Bible, we will conclude that we, that those who have discovered mistakes in the Bible do not think that the Bible is the same as the grave. It doesn't mean that we understand how to solve all the different we are really no different than scientists who claim to love all the things we think we the natural world. They don't deny the integrity of the natural world just to claim that it is the same. Like the scientists of the natural world, scientists will acknowledge the truth of the natural world. As we do, we won't suggest that the same thing is the same. Meanwhile, the those of you who can't get how the Bible says that Jesus is not the same as the Bible, we can see that it's not parts of the Bible, that it's not parts of the Bible that Jesus is the same as the Bible is the same. Finally, as the critics who actually maintain an unfiltered Bible, what would convince them that the Bible is really God? In other words, what would convince them that Jesus actually rose from the dead or that inerrancy is true? Maybe they maybe they have to reconsider the evidence we present in this book. Unfortunately, many critics will not do this. They will not allow facts to interfere with their desire to convince the people over their own lives. After all, if the credit were to exist in the last two years, they have to admit that the people are controlled by their thoughts. Their main authority in the universe greater than themselves, and the authority might not have proven what it means to the light of the Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you a question here, and then we'll finish uh, with the conclusion. Could Jesus appear uh, to every person on earth to prove that he rose from the dead? Could he do that? Why doesn't he? Yeah, because if he shows himself that he's risen, If we if we saw Jesus in all his glory, which is how he would have to appear, right? If he's going to appear uh, to everyone, um, and and C.S. Lewis says if he would show himself even in any mitigated form, it would override our free will, um, and that's the, the I think I've I've read that um, quote to you. Uh, and uh, at the end of that quote, uh, C.S. Lewis says, he can never ravage, he can only rule. And uh, that, is, that is true, because the whole idea was for people to freely love God. And you can't do that. Um, and the example I usually use is, you know, if someone puts a gun to my head and says, tell me you love me, what am I going to say? Either I'm going home to Jesus, or, or I love you, uh, which overrides my free will in a sense. I mean, I could have, have say something like that, but, uh, but that with a gun to your head, you really don't have um, that that choice. So, um, so that's that's why he doesn't do that. Uh, why he doesn't just show himself to. God has given us enough evidence. If, if we're not willing to take him at his word on that evidence, then there's probably nothing um, that would cause that person to, to uh, bow to the God and to believe in the Bible and Christ and all those things. A conclusion and summary. Jesus taught that the Jewish Old Testament is the inherent word of God, and he promised that the rest of God's word would come through his apostles. 
The apostles who were authenticated by miracles wrote or confirmed 27 books. All major books were immediately recognized as part of God's word, um, those connected with the apostles themselves. Um, uh, so, and all of the 27 books were later recognized as authentic by early church councils. Uh, in other words, the Bible we have today is the true and errant word of God. Um, the story that goes around is that at, at the can usually they say the can Council of Nicaea, uh, and, and that it was a power play between different parts of the church at that time uh, about which ones got in and which ones didn't. The, the scriptures were seen as, um, as authoritative, um, and an errant from a very early time. Peter, in his in his uh, writings in the Bible, talk about Paul's Paul writing scripture. That Paul's writings are scripture. Um, so the church recognized the um, the books very early on that were authoritative, that were true, um, that were God breathed, um, and church councils talked about those things. But it wasn't the Church of Ma the Council of Nicaea looking on which one it was. It just affirmed what was already done. When, when um, so I don't know if you know this, you probably do, especially kids in the AP history. When we have a, a pres presidential election, we know the winner, like within maybe that night or within days, right? Generally speaking, unless you're, you know. Bush v. Gore, and that's just a little animal. I stayed up all night watching that, by the way. Just And I kept going, and I almost woke up my sister. I was at my sister's house. And it was a crazy thing. Anyway, we won't get into that. But is it is it fully um, like litigated? There's, there's this thing that happens after that where they go through all the, the you know, everything, and they make sure that they got it right. And that's when it is certified. That's when the new president, and he doesn't even take office until later, you know, in, in January. But it isn't known for sure, for sure, until it's certified. And um, in, in this case, we have enough to say that this is true. Um, and um, so uh, uh, the, the, the teaching, I'm going to read this again. The Bible is, no, so, so we have enough to say, look, this, this really happened. Uh, since the Bible is our established standard for truth, anything that contradicts a teaching in the Bible is false. Uh, this does not mean that there are no, there is no truth in other religions. It simply means that any specific teaching that contradicts a teaching of the Bible is false. So if someone says, um, I believe that, or a, a lot of religions say this, that we're saved by works, it can look differently. That's false. Because it contradicts the Bible, which we know is true. Uh, now let's review the conclusions we've drawn since chapter 1. Uh, the truth uh, about uh, reality is knowable. The opposite of truth is false. It is true that the theistic God exists. This is evidenced by the beginning of the universe, the cosmological argument, the design of the universe, the teleological argument, the anthropic principle, uh, the design of life, the teleological argument, uh, moral law, um, the moral argument. If God exists, then miracles are possible. Miracles can be used to confirm a message from God, as in acts of God to confirm a word from God. The New Testament is historically reliable. This is evidenced by early testimony, eyewitness testimony, uninvented, authentic testimony, eyewitnesses who were not deceived. The New Testament says Jesus claimed to be God. Jesus claimed to be God. It was miraculously confirmed by his fulfillment of many prophecies about himself, his sinless life and miraculous deeds, his prediction and accomplishment of his resurrection. Therefore, Jesus is God. Whatever Jesus, who is God, teaches uh, is true. 
Jesus taught that the word Bible is the word of God. Therefore, it is true that the Bible is the word of God, and anything opposed to it is false. Let's go back to chapter 8 to unpack the implications of this. The evidence we had gathered to up to chapter 8, points 1 through 3 above, helped us conclude that all non-theistic worldviews and religions are false. This left us to consider the three major theistic world religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Which of them is true? The evidence presented in chapters 9 through 14 and points 4 through 12 above now yield their verdict. The revelation of Judaism is true, but it is incomplete. It lacks the New Testament. The revelation of Islam has some truth, but it errs on some fundamental teachings, including its denial of the deity and resurrection of Christ. Only the revelation of Christianity is complete, the complete and errant word of God. Could we be wrong about all this? It's possible. But in light of, what, of, the, in, but in light of the evidence, critics, skeptics, and those other, of other faiths need to have a lot more faith than we do. So uh, let's turn now in your little atheist book um, to um, the Equip 9 and 10. And we're on uh, pages uh, 100 and 101. So how can a Bible be inherent? What are, what are some um, facts that... Um, that show the inerrancy of the law. Yes. But even if there's like minor issues that it doesn't change the Right. So at, at any place where there is some um, and there are very few places, right, where we're not entirely sure um, what the original said. Uh, it never is something that that would change a doctrine of uh, of Christianity. What is the um, logical argument that they give for this? I want to make sure you write this. Yes. The people of God came on the Bible was revealed. So, so God cannot err. He can't. There's no error in Him. The Bible is the Word of God. I just read that um, this morning, uh, and in, in the Bible. Um, therefore, the Bible cannot err because if it's from God, He is inerrant. So anything from Him is inerrant. Now, well, that. A logical argument, I mean, if one is true and two is true, then three has to be true. Will that work on an unbeliever? Of course not, because they don't, they don't believe that God can't err, right? Or, or they don't maybe believe there is no God at all. Uh, so that's not a place to start, but if you're a believer, it's a good um, understanding of, of the truth. So... Um, uh, yeah. So you have to get them there um, until you, uh, for you to be able to say this. And that's why this is at the end of the book instead of at the beginning. Of the book. Um, that's why we start with why is there something instead of not something. Uh, question uh, 10. Uh, describe four errors made by critics when examining the Bible. What's, uh, what's yes? Um, well, I want you to write down exactly what it says in in the book. Okay, so failing to understand the context of a passage. Um, Sometimes we can, um, what's the, yeah. So um, I've told you this before, but I'm going to tell it to you again. That there was a guy at our church that was doing Sunday school. And um, it was this taking a, it was about psalms and, and taking a psalm and 
teaching it to the class. And this guy uh, was teaching on a psalm. And I don't even remember the psalm, and I don't remember what he said. But he said, I was looking at this while I was out hunting. And I was reading it, and, and then I read this verse. And I took that to mean, maybe I'll bag a deer this weekend. Maybe I won't. That is horrific for me. That is not what it means. I, I love this saying that says, the Bible can't mean what it never meant. The Bible cannot mean what it never meant. And you have to take it in its context to see what it means. If you, if you just take, um, say, from Proverbs, there is no God. And you don't put in, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. That's a very different thing to say. So if you're going to cherry pick these verses and, and create um, theology around them, then you're going to end up with a false theology. So uh, you have to, to look at the context of the passage. Um, just yesterday, um, I talked to the sophomores about leveret marriage. Um, and it's when the, the the um, uh, scribes came to Jesus, and, or no, the Sadducees came to Jesus and said, you know, there was a man, you know, and and he um, he died without children, and so the first brother married her, and he died without children, uh, and then the third one, he died without children. All seven brothers ended up marrying her, and there were no children, um, and they all they all died. And and if you just read that, you go. That's weird. What's that about? It's about a lo Old Testament law that the people Jesus was talking to, he wouldn't have had to explain it. They, under they understood it. Um, and leveret marriage was to protect women. That if, if, if when a woman was widowed, she needed someone to take care of her. Uh, and usually that was a son. But if you had no children, then you had no one to take care of you. And so it was, it was a law that the, the next brother or the closest male relative would marry that woman. Now, have you read Ruth? Yeah, that's leveret marriage. Who was who, he was Boaz was Ruth's second nearest kinsman. He Boaz goes to the first nearest kinsman and says, Hey, will you want to marry this girl? And and the whole thing is that the, the idea is that you marry that man, you have children with that man, and those children are accounted to the dead husband. Now, I know it sounds weird to us, but in a, in a, um, uh, a time and a culture where women needed to be protected, uh, it was important. Why did they have to have children? So that she would be taken care of by her children. Um, so uh, that, that, would, that only makes sense in the context of leather and marriage, right? If you don't understand that, you're not going to understand the past. No, the Bible is speaking in care of those who need that need help. Um, that's that's the value. The value is care for the widow, the aged, and the orphan. Care for those who can't take care of themselves. Okay, what's another one? Yes. Assuming that divergent Assuming the divergent counts are contradictory, um, and uh, we see this in in the anointing of Jesus, where um, one, and we talked about this last year too, where Mary in John is anointing Jesus' feet. In Matthew and Mark that are the same accounts, it talks about his head. There are reasons for that. It isn't, first of all, he pro she, she probably, I mean, it was this much God, right? It was this much perfume. That's too much for me, right? He, he probably, and, and Jesus says she's anointing my body for burial. Uh, so uh, it, they're they're not divergent. They're just ha they just ha uh, highlight different details. Um, uh, so then, what's another one? Yes. Um, presuming that the Bible is purposeful. Yeah, this is my favorite one. Assuming that the Bible uh, uh, um, uh, is uh, approves everything that it records. A number of years ago, a lot of years ago, 
uh, two young Mormon men came to my house. And um, I stepped out uh, on the porch and, and I spoke with them. And uh, and somehow we got on to polygamy. And they said, well, well, polygamy is God's best. We don't do it anymore. But, uh, but it's still God's best. And, and even their gods, right? So the God of this world, as when you die, Mormons believe that when, when a ma Mormon male dies, so you have a Mormon in good standing, he has many spirit wives. So there's polyg polygamy in the afterlife. Does the Bible record polygamy? Does the Bible approve polygamy? No, nowhere does it, right? Uh, and, and everywhere in the New Testament, it, it talks, and even Adam and Eve, right? One man, one woman, for love. That's, that's what the Bible teaches. There's polygamy in the Bible. Is there murder in the Bible? Yeah. Does it approve of murder in the Bible? No. So uh, it doesn't approve of everything it records. Um, and then the last one is forgetting it's a human book with human characteristic. Um, so uh, take, take Revelation and, and what uh, John saw. John saw things that were literally unbelievable and literally indescribable. And I, I feel so sorry for him. He's, and he keeps saying, well, it looked sort of like a topaz with a gleaming thing that was floating around. And that, you know, he couldn't, he was seeing unutterable things. Uh, and he had to do his best to describe that. Uh, these are human writers human authors who are sinful as we are, um, and, and um, it, it has those human characteristics. Another example I brought you in Galatians, where Paul is just frustrated with people saying, you have to believe in Jesus and be circumcised to, um, to be a Christian. And he, he denounces it in the harshest terms. And at one point he says, I just wish they'd cut the whole thing off. They'd just emasculate themselves. That's in the Bible. That's because it's a human, it's written by a human who is frustrated at that time. Um, so uh, we can see that. Yeah, it's, and you look it up in Galatians, it's, it's there. Um, what? <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what, what <laughs> so that's it for today, and uh, we we ended it with a bang, I guess, and uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll pick up with the engaged tomorrow and study for the quiz. Yes.